Welcome to Because We Care for Young Homemakers Day, a weekly program filled with information on the art of homemaking. And now here's your host, Kimberly Ross. Hello and welcome to Young Homemaker. As we enter the Christmas season, our thoughts turn to festivities and preparation. But we also need to give thought to fire safety in our home. My guest today is Michael Gibbons. He is Battalion Chief with the Upper Arlington Fire Department. And he's going to tell us how we can have a safe and happy holiday season. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Is it true, do the statistics say that fires are greater during the holidays in homes? I think that we, uh, we do have some certain potential problems during the holidays. Uh, with children and with the various decorations that we have. Children just being out of school sometimes creates the problem because they do end up with some idle time. What is so appealing about candlelight or, or lights or extension cords to children? Well, I think especially <clears throat> when we're dis discussing candles, flame of any kind is kind of fascinating to adults and children. Uh, when you're an adult, you like to sit in front of a fireplace or sit around a bonfire. Uh, cook hot dogs or marshmallows, that type of thing. Children have the same fascination. And when you have the flame on the candle and it's there in the house, it's something that they can look at and watch. And, and like I say, it's fascinating to everyone. And whenever you have the small child and the candle with the flame, then you have a potential problem. What age group of children are we talking about that are particularly <coughs> susceptible? I think we're talking about everything from toddler, uh, clear up through uh, maybe preschool, uh, kindergarten, first grade. Uh, we do have some problems with children, even with the fascination of fire, up to age of 14 or 15. But uh, in the home, around the, the holidays, with the candles, I would say the, the younger children. That's not really abnormal, is it? It's just oh, no. their curiosity. No, it's, it's a very normal curiosity. And like I say, adults still find that curiosity, even, even through uh, uh, old age, they still like the fires and, and to sit in front of the fireplace. Flame is an important part of the holidays in decorating uh, the home. Now, how can we educate our children to stay away from that and to make them aware of the dangers? Well, I think this comes with the basic education uh, all along. You know, uh, flame or fire will hurt you, heat, um, the, the things that burn up. Uh, I think children need to be uh, taught the difference. Uh, you know, fire can be very helpful. It can be a tool. It can cook our food, can heat our homes. But they also need to know that there's a destructive side. And uh, if they're taught properly and if when they're around a fireplace or around a bonfire or something like that, they're educated properly by the parents and through the various education programs that may be taught in the schools, that uh, they might have an understanding of how to handle it or how to deal with the flame and the fire. The Upper Arlington Fire Department has a program available too. Can you explain a little bit about that program and what goes on? Sure. We have a program in Upper Arlington. We start with preschool children. It goes clear up through the eighth grade. But when we're talking about the smaller children, we, I brought a couple things here. <clears throat> we have a puppet, and we have a puppet show that we teach, and this is Uncle Alert. Uh, we kind of coined that name because of Upper Arlington. But in the program, Uncle Alert is the person that is the educator, and we have Quackers the Duck that uh, plays with the fire and ends up setting a fire. And it's about a 10 minute program that we, like I say, we teach to preschool, kindergarten, and even into first grade. And, and the children can get a real feel for what can happen and uh, how to prevent fires by not playing with matches and that type of That's thing. That's a very creative way to teach children. We have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I'll bet they uh, do learn out of example from um, acting out then. Right. It's, what can happen? It, with the program, it's very entertaining for one thing to the smaller children. Uh, it's short because, and they don't get uh, sidetracked because of the program being too long. Uh, it does have a very good educational uh, uh, benefit from it, but like I say, it's entertaining to them also. Say we have a toddler or a smaller child in the home and we're decorating the holidays. Now this may be the, the first year they're really aware of things. So what sort of things should we look out for aside from candles? Okay, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> extension cords a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Extension cords can be a problem because you're uh, extending the length of the wire to provide electric current to a tree or to some other type of decoration. Whenever you extend the length of the wire, you take a greater chance of that wire heating up. And I think probably a good rule to follow is don't use extension cords over six feet long. And when you do use an extension cord, Make sure that it is at least the size, if not bigger, than the item that you're trying to light up. In other words, you don't try to, uh, to use an iron 
with a lamp cord extension cord. You need a cord that's that's designed to take the the voltage and the amperage that the uh, the, the iron's going to put out in order to extend that cord. A lot of people use extension cords to light up their Christmas tree and I've noticed a lot of times with our extension cords they don't quite go all the way into the socket. Can that be dangerous too? Definitely. They, they should, you should make sure that they go all the way into the socket. Uh, if for some reason that the person's going to use one that doesn't, it might be a good idea to wrap some type of electrical tape around that so you don't have a gap to where there could be any arcing or anything, but I think most importantly don't use that find something that will fit. Now the Christmas tree lights don't require a whole lot of electricity. They're mostly a, a lower type of voltage light, but uh, be sure you have an adequate extension cord and an adequate connection. On the end of a lot of the extension cords there are two or three, maybe more, outlets. Should you use all those? No, you probably shouldn't because there again, uh, if you take an extension cord that's a lamp cord size and you have three outlets and you plug three lamps in, then you're putting a greater demand on that single extension cord. So it should only be one item per extension cord. Now if you're going to attach two or three strings of lights on your tree and just plug it into one extension cord, you're probably okay. But don't run two or three things off of that cord. Okay. I want to get back to candles for just a minute because <coughs> I want to know if there's any sort of law um, that guides people as to open flame, as in a candle or a kerosene lamp? Are there any, um, I don't know how you... State, state, state ordinances? Codes. Yes, there are state codes, but they primarily uh, deal with commercial buildings. Um, churches are, are involved, uh, other commercial buildings, businesses. That's where it's primarily regulated. We can't do a whole lot about telling you what you can or you cannot have in your home. Um, we do recommend that if you're going to have a candle in your home is to have something around that candle like a, uh, a glass mantle or something so in the event that it does get tipped over it's not the flame is not out in the open where it can catch something on fire it's still contained in a glass bulb of some kind uh, something like a votive candle those are okay but i would prefer something to see something a little higher if you go into some of your restaurants you'll have a candle say this high but you'll have a globe that comes up maybe four to six inches above that flame this protects that flame it keeps people from getting their arms into it when they stretch across the table in a restaurant let's say um, the same thing when let's say you put a, a candle on your mantle and you have some greenery around it uh, if it gets tipped over at least it's contained somewhat if you a, a votive candle you don't have uh, very much space between the candle and the top of the votive. I notice they get awfully hot too. Right, they can get extremely hot. And in some cases, the wrong type of candle can crack those. I see. And it can actually destroy the glass and any protection that you have. Going back to greenery. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's do that. This is one thing that we, we try to discourage people from putting uh, uh, roping and that type of thing of cut greenery in the home. Uh, it doesn't take very long for that to dry out. Mm -hmm. And when it dries out, it catches extremely quick. And once a fire starts, it just progresses in just a matter of two to three minutes. You can have a major fire in, in that length of time. If you're going to use that, there are several treatments on the market that will uh, uh, retard any flame spread or anything. Oh, that that's interesting. That. Uh, where would they find that? Nurseries? Uh, probably at nurseries. Uh, some of the fire departments know of, of different kinds of solutions you can mix up with borax and water. <clears throat> there are some sprays now on the market that uh, are extremely good. We tested one in our division. I don't recall the name of it right now, but you could spray it on. You put two or three applications, allow it to dry, and then when you set a, a flame t or a match to it, it would actually flame for just about two seconds and then it would uh, go out. A lot of people like to put greenery on their fireplace, which is beautiful, but I can see the potential harm that that could do. Is an alternative maybe plastic? Yes. Uh, anytime we're talking about uh, pine, uh, we would prefer that you have an artif artificial tree or artificial greenery. And there's a lot of that that looks very real now. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's a little expensive to buy to start with. But if you look at the safety factor and you look at the number of years you can keep it, I think that the safety factor and even economically, it, it will save you money in the long run. What about live greenery outside the home? That's not as much of a problem. Uh, I would keep it away from uh, a lot of the wood areas of your home. If you're going to put it around, around a banister or something, say a wrought iron banister going down uh, your steps to your walkway, that would be okay. 
but I'd be very careful about putting it around uh, wooden porch pillars or under eaves, that type of thing, because there again, it's safer outside, but you also could have a greater problem if, if you have some uh, mischievous young children out and they might set that on fire uh, just to you know stir up a little problem in the neighborhood or something. They could be a real problem to the outside of the house, which could extend into the inside and cause a major fire. Right. Do they still put candles on Christmas trees? No. We hope they don't anyway. Yeah. I know it's been two or three years ago someone called our Fire Prevention Bureau and asked exactly what they should do to put uh, real candles on their tree and, and we very quickly told them that that's something you should not do. Mm -hmm. A Christmas tree will burn in about three to four minutes and I mean it's an extremely hot fire. You get more calls during the holidays? Uh, I Maybe a small percentage of calls. We don't Luckily, we haven't had a lot of Christmas tree fires. Last year, I think we had two Christmas tree fires. Uh, we do get, probably get an increase in calls because there's more people at home, but those aren't fire runs. A lot of times they're emergency runs. The children are getting hurt a little more. Uh, they're outside playing in the snow, sled riding if we have snow. Uh, they're around the home, and toward the end of the holidays, they tend to get a little bored. So they, they start to investigate mm -hmm. and to, uh, to look for things to do, and sometimes they get hurt. That should warn parents to be a little more perceptive of what's going on in their home then. Right. Whenever you have small children at home, uh, parents need to, to know where they, the children are, keep an eye on them, uh, make sure they're safe. What would be the major cause of fire in a home during the holidays? Um, I think we have two probably two causes that you would consider major, and one of them is accidental because of a child playing with a, a fire. The other one is the extended use of electricity because of the tree and the other lighted decorations could be a, a problem. What happens when there is an electrical fire? <clears throat> How does it begin? Well, as you mentioned earlier, the, the two plugs that don't go together, all you would need is a slight arc from that. Uh, someone walking through the house or the children playing around the Christmas tree and maybe just catching their foot or their hand on the cord and pulling it partially out of the, the plug or the socket on the wall. Whenever you have a loose connection, then you stand a greater chance of arcing. And there again, you have more decorations around. You have cloth. You have the angel hair or uh, imitation snow. That, that it's like cotton. And whenever you have an arc around that, you take a greater chance of, of a flame occurring. And once it starts, it just, it just continues and extends very rapidly. Mm -hmm. it, it starts with smoke, or does it start with flame? You can just start with flame. Mm -hmm. Now, you get the smoke when something is usually smoldering. If you have a good flame, chances are you won't have much smoke at all. And that's more dangerous, I would think. It, it progresses much more quickly. Right. When you have the smoke, uh, at least you have some indication that you have something smoldering in a corner. Mm -hmm. But if it comes out and you just start with flame, then you have very little indication if you're in another room until the fire's to the point to where you can actually see it. We probably use our fireplaces more during the Christmas season because it's, it's lots of fun to have a roaring fire. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some guidelines on uh, how careful we should be and what we should do to prevent a fire from there? I think uh, typical fireplace safety, you know, for the entire year, first of all, you should have the fireplace checked out to make sure you don't have cracks in the firebox or in any of the masonry work that's going up. Because if you do, fire or sparks can get in through there and over a period of time can st uh, start a fire uh, in the actual framework of the house if, if that crack extends. If you don't have your chimneys cleaned every year, especially if you burn a lot of wood, you tend to build up a lot of creosote in the chimney. And those chimneys should be cleaned out or you could have a chimney fire. There again, if you have a chimney fire, it could extend into the house if you have the cracks. Mm -hmm. um, always be sure you have a fireplace screen mm -hmm. in front of the, um, the fireplace in case you have popping wood or anything. You don't want anything to come out on the carpeting. And uh, of course, keep children away so they don't get their hands burned or don't get anything. Don't burn paper. Uh, and in a, a fireplace, a lot of people tend to take their wrappings and throw them in. This is a very easy way to start a, a chimney fire because uh, then those, those uh, particles of the paper will go up through the chimney and maybe get caught on the creosote. You should only burn good seasoned wood uh, in your fireplace. I know people still tend to burn, burn the wrappings and things like that, but they should uh, avoid that. I was going to ask a question about husbands and fireplaces. It seems as if on Christmas morning, they gather everything up and they throw it in the fireplace to get a roaring fire going and sometimes that can overdo it, can it? That's where we need the wives to tell the husbands <laughs> not to do it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about space heaters now. Uh, we're going to be using those soon if we haven't already. 
Are those wise to use in a house? <clears throat> well, let me point out one thing. In the city of Upper Arlington, uh, we have drafted an ordinance against the kerosene space heaters. Uh, we feel that there's just a great potential for uh, a, a fire with those. Most of it becomes human air because they're pretty perfected as far as the heater goes, but they, they have two problems. The one problem is the people tend to forget the actual instructions. Every time they use it, they don't go read the instructions. So there is a, a room for air there, and if there is some air, then there's the potential because people uh, will fill them without shutting them off. And that way you've got a flammable liquid and mm. flame right there. Would they blow up? They can blow up, yes. Uh, usually with the kerosene, you'll have a flash fire and it can extend uh, throughout the house. A lot of people in the last uh, couple years since kerosene heaters have been on the market have uh, gotten confused and have put gas mm. in the heaters. This causes an explosion. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually when we have a situation like that, it's been a major fire. Uh, resulting in injuries and death. This uh, Is that why the ordinance was well, put into effect? We saw these things. We haven't had the problem with the oh. space heaters in Arlington, luckily. Throughout the state of Ohio, though, they have had several fires. I'm not, not just say several, let's say in the hundreds of fires uh, throughout the, the state where that have been attributed to uh, kerosene space heaters. Another problem that you run into is if, if you don't use them properly in a well-ventilated room, those type of heaters tend to use up the oxygen in the room. And we've had, actually had some deaths throughout the state where a person has died of suffocation. From kerosene from, heaters? From the kerosene heaters, just because all the oxygen has been used up. Mm. Another thing with them, if they're not kept uh, maintained properly, then they'll give off carbon monoxide, which I think everyone knows is a very deadly mm -hmm. uh, product of combustion. So you would suggest not using um, kerosene space heaters at all? Especially not in the home. I know people will still do it, and I know that sometimes they feel that it's an efficient way to, to heat a particular room. Uh, our recommendations up there uh, are not to use them in Arlington, and I would say any place else that they're still permitted is to use them in a garage area or something like that, very well ventilated. Uh, make sure you read your instructions very carefully and know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. When you refuel them, shut them off, take them outside, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Okay. How about electric space heaters? Electric space heaters, uh, they're, of course, much safer. Uh, of course, you have to be, be very careful with children around them because they can go up and touch them. I was checking just about two weeks ago <clears throat> in a lot of the hardware stores in our area, and almost all of the space heaters, if they're tipped over, they automatically shut off. And that's good. They have a kind of a safety switch on them. Mm -hmm. And so any time that they're tipped past a certain point, then they automatically shut off. So it's a safety feature. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that they're probably okay as long as they're, the instructions are followed. The children can still get burned on Certainly. pretty badly. Mm -hmm. Would you take us through a typical home decorated for the holidays and point out some potential problems and give us some solutions so we can still decorate yet not have danger in our home? I think uh, to start with, I would recommend that, again, anybody use artificial trees and artificial greenery. Uh, a lot of people tend to put bows around the house and they make them out of fabric. Uh, find fabric that is flame retardant. Uh, don't use extension cords to excess. Uh, only use those that you need and be sure that you use just one item off of each extension cord and make sure those cords are capable of handling the, the current flow. Okay. I think one problem that people tend to neglect and overlook because it's something that, uh, that a lady does every day in her house, and that's cook. Mm. She's usually cooking more food for a larger number of people because people are coming to visit. Mm -hmm. And she's got a lot of things on the, on the stove and, and cooking in a lot of different pots. And they may be wearing a robe or something, reaching across that stove. Uh, can catch uh, robes and nightgowns and that type of thing. Does that happen a thing. lot? It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing that they need to be aware of. You know, I've caught a potholder on fire, too, doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. That could be dangerous. It's just something that you tend to do and don't think about the flame. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have an electric range, it's a little less uh, dangerous as far as reaching across because you don't have the flame. Right. But still, if something comes in contact with that burner, it, uh, it will catch fire. Mm-hmm. Say a couple go, goes away for a, a weekend and the woman forgets to turn her oven off. They have to go <clears throat> 300 miles back and turn it off? 
or is that a potential danger? Sure, it's a potential danger. I, I would say that the oven, depending on the degree it's set at, it may not be as much of a problem as if a burner were on on top of the stove. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you're, you know, it's going to get very warm. It's going to cost a lot of money because you're using either electric or gas. Mm -hmm. But uh, you may not have a major problem. If you have a gas range or a gas oven, you may have, have a buildup of carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. uh, we have always told people not to use uh, kitchen ranges to heat the kitchen because it's not vented. Mm -hmm. And anytime you don't have a flame vented, you take those chance of building up some carbon monoxide. I see. But uh, I don't think that that would be a major problem, but if you do realize that it's off, it may be a good idea to call someone that could go over, uh, maybe some a neighbor that might have a key for security purposes to go in and shut it off. Mm -hmm. What about upstairs or in the bedrooms? Any potential fire dangers there? We have very few problems uh, in bedrooms as far as fires. I'd say most of the bedroom fires that we have are because of, of uh, accidental fires, children playing with matches, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, but still, that doesn't eliminate the electrical cause. If somebody has a, a clock radio and a couple other things, a television, all plugged into the same uh, electrical uh, socket, then they could have a problem. Okay. What about the importance of fire alarms? We need one in our homes? Definitely. I think that since uh, smoke detectors have come onto the market, and uh, I would say the majority of the people across the country have realized the need, whether they've bought them or not, I don't know, but have realized the need and started buying them, uh, the death rate has, has really dropped off. And it's not to say that they'll uh, pr prevent the fire from happening. But what they're designed for is to wake you up and get you out of the house. So if the house burns, it's one thing. You can replace your, your uh, possessions, but you can't replace the people. Smoke alarms are probably as good as the batteries that are in them, right? That's correct. I brought a couple smoke alarms here. We've got the one that I have here. And uh, I, I won't push the button on it, but uh, we've replaced this battery. We found this in a home mm. that we were called to a fire run, and the house was, was on fire. And this detector was still going off. <clears throat> now we take right? this out to some of our school programs and still push the button and let the sound go off mm -hmm. so that the kids can see that it still works. Is that a real expensive model? Or no, I, I would guess that this probably cost maybe seven or eight dollars, maybe up to ten dollars. Mm -hmm. When smoke detectors first came on the mar market, they would run about thirty. But as uh, more uh, products come on the market and more competition, then the price uh, declined and now you can get detectors anywhere from seven to twelve dollars. So really a person could afford to have more than one. Oh yes, and, and we recommend, depending on the, the style of house you live in, we recommend uh, usually more than one detector. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you need to know when you do buy a detector, and we're not recommending any brand, but we have a little label here that says UL approved and that's Underwriters Laboratories. And it's very important that whenever you buy um, any type of smoke detector that it is approved by a testing laboratory such as Underwriters Labs. Where would you suggest a family putting smoke alarms in their home? Okay, if you have a one-story home, a ranch-style home, it's probably a good idea to have one at the top of the basement stairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying keep it down about 18 inches from the top of the stair because as smoke comes up, it will tend to swirl and it may miss it if it's right up against the uh, the top of the stairs or the, by the door. So mm -hmm. keep it about 18 inches down on the ceiling and that way as the smoke comes up that stairway which is acting like a natural chimney it will hit that detector. The second place would be to have one just outside the kitchen area. If you put them in the kitchen area they tend to false alarm because steam will set them off or if you have some bacon cooking sometimes that will set it off. Mm -hmm. But if it's just outside the kitchen area then uh, uh, it will detect smoke from the house, but it won't false alarm. It may still false alarm a little bit, not, mm -hmm. but not as frequently as it would if it, as, as if it were in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, how about going upstairs? Okay. Now, if you've got a two-story house, then I would put one right at the top of the stairs going up to the second story. Uh, if you have a common area, put it on the ceiling about center. Mm -hmm. If it's just the staircase going up and then a room going off one direction and the other, just have it somewhere at the top on the ceiling. Is it a good idea to have your family engage in a fire drill? And if so, how can they organize that? Okay, the, a lot of different fire departments will put out information telling you how to put a fire drill together. Fire drills, a lot of people think are silly, but especially when you have younger children, you need to go over the procedures uh, to tell them that when they 
if they uh, uh, are w uh, <coughs> woken up at night, that they um, feel the doors. They should sleep with their doors closed to uh, keep any smoke from coming into their room. Mm -hmm. uh, feel the doors to see if there's heat. If there's heat at the doors, they shouldn't go out that way. They should go out a window. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they'll have a, um, a porch roof they can go out on or something like that. If there's not heat at the door, they need to know how to open the door very slowly and then to move down uh, a hallway and to the closest door for exit. After they get out, they need to know that there needs to be a central meeting place so that mom and dad can check to make sure everyone's there so when the fire department does arrive that they can say, well, someone's missing or everybody's here. That tends to, to change the procedures that the fire division uses when they uh, actually come in to, to fight the fire. Or to keep a parent from running back in to seeing where right, a child is. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people will run out and children will say, oh, I left my teddy bear in there and they mm -hmm. want to go back in after, or the family dog or the cat. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you need to say, you know, the firemen will find them for you. Mm -hmm. Keep them outside. Don't ever go back into a building once you've escaped. And uh, just a point of interest, if there is a cat or a dog in a house, the firemen will, will put forth an extra effort to try to get the family pet out. A lot of people don't think they'll ever have to go through that experience, but if they do, it's nice to know what to do and have a clear head about it, right? Right. Yeah, people always think that uh, the fire happens to people down the street mm -hmm. or next door. Fire never happens to me. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, when it does happen to them, they say, you know, if we had only done this. So I think the best thing to do is, is prevention. Uh, prevent the fires from happening. And secondly, if we know that we can't prevent every fire from happening, we need to know what to do in the event of a fire, which is, is the uh, fire drill, the escape plan. Let's end on a lighter note. How can we decorate our home for the holidays yet feel safe that our home is protected and, and there, the chances of a fire will be a lot less? Okay. I, I would say for decorating, just use as much flame retardant material as you can. Um, if you want a live tree or a tree that, that's not artificial, get one that has the, uh, the bald roots on it. And that way uh, you can take it out and plant it after Christmas. How I see that way it won't dry out. Thanks for being with us. I learned a lot and I hope you did. And I hope you have a safe and happy holiday season. Thanks for joining us.